And, and it, oftentimes there's an approach of, oh, population control. Yeah, let's look. Can we all agree that those two words should never be uttered in the same sentence again? <laughs> um, especially by white men. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that's kind of silly. And, and Lois is the real expert here, so it's silly for me to talk about that. But we, we did a little bit of the math saying it isn't just the carbon footprint that matters. It's also the number of feet. Right? And uh, so as we think about, you know, are we going to live in a planet of 8 billion, 9 billion, 10? It will matter. Now, admittedly, a lot of that population growth will be in some of the poorest places of the world uh, where the carbon emissions are far less than, let's say, ours in this room, for example. Uh, but nevertheless, a billion people, more or less, is a billion people, more or less. That's huge. And so we did find that when you think about the things that are really the positive levers for change that also affect uh, reproductive trajectories in the future, like educating girls, access to family planning, things that Lois and others have dedicated their lives to, was also intersected with climate solutions as well. In fact, when we put kind of women and girls solutions together, they became one of the most powerful things we can do. And it's not just on population, by the way. There's other things that women disproportionately have a role in smallholder farming, also in collecting fuel wood and what's cooked at home, food waste, water decisions, things like this. So especially in other, you know, and especially in the developing world. So I think there's a lot more there, but Lois and I have talked about this before, the communities that kind of think about climate change and the communities that think about kind of reproductive health and women's rights, we haven't learned to talk to each other quite yet. We need to kind of come together because we're often talking about very similar issues. And when we discover that, it's very exciting. And, and the latter part of your question, the reception to that was kind of interesting uh, because I think we avoided the trap of calling it population control, you know, like that stupid old thing. We did avoid that trap, but it, it, it raised more questions than answers, and that's good. Um, it got people to think a little bit, but we, now we need to do, and that's where we get to go where mm -hmm. Lois is going. Kate Brandt, uh, gender equity and opportunity is a big issue in tech. Uh, I'm curious if it, at your work at Google, if the gender conversations are, are separate from the sustainability conversations, if they ever, in, if they ever connect. Yeah, it's a great question, and I so appreciate the work that you both have been doing on this topic, and of course, John, your colleague, Catherine Wilkinson, who has just been doing excellent work in this space. Um, I think for us, actually, where the issues intersect the most is almost all the women leading our sustain, almost all the people leading our sustainability work at Google are women, um, and a couple of them are actually here with us tonight. Um, but I, I have noticed this not just at Google, but um, across a lot of women, a lot of people that are leaders in this space, we're increasingly seeing women taking leadership roles. Mm -hmm. um, so I think obviously the tech and gender conversation is critical. It's not part of my remit, but I feel really proud that so many of the people that are leading this work for us and at other companies and at other organizations are women. And what are the, some of the big levers that you have at Google to, to get at greenhouse gas reductions? Because it's so big. What are some of the big levers? Yeah. So for us at Google, we you know have initially really started with our own operations. Um, so really dating back to our founding 20 years ago now, um, our founders have always deeply cared about this issue. And so it's really grown up inside of the company, inside of how we operate the business. And um, some of the big levers we have are how we use energy. So as you probably know, you know all the tools and services we use every day, YouTube and Gmail, um, are run in data centers. And data centers use a lot of energy. So from the time we started building our first data center um, over a decade ago, we've been laser focused on not only how do we build them as efficiently as possible, but also how do we ultimately move towards clean energy. So we've been carbon neutral since 2007, and we've been on a journey of procuring renewable energy. And so we are now matching 100% of our energy with renewable sources. But along the way, it's been really important to us to figure out how do we drive policy change? How do we enable more clean electrons to get on grids all over the world so that we can not only meet our goal, which is to be 100% renewable, but actually to help green grids to bring down prices so that we can all more move towards a carbon-free future. Greenpeace has a project uh, called Click Clean that evaluates uh, the cloud and data centers of a lot of different businesses. Uh, so for video streaming, they, they, and they issue grades regarding uh, renewable energy, their advocacy, and transparency. And Greenpeace issues grades uh, Netflix, D, Vimeo, D, Hulu, F, <laughs> HBO, D, Amazon Prime, C, they've been a laggard, they've been improving lately, this one hurts, NPR, F, 
Pandora F, SoundCloud F, YouTube A. So let's give it up for uh, <laughs> YouTube. Um, hey, hey. <coughs> um, you know, and that's coming from consumer pressure. So, so Kate Brandt, um, why are do those other companies um, so bad? <laughs> why, why, why do those other companies lag so much? I mean, consumers seem to care about this stuff. They're, it's not getting through. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're increasingly seeing a lot of companies doing great work in this space. I, I think we've seen a tremendous uptick across the tech sector in many sectors, but there's clearly a lot of work to be done. And I think hearing that expression mm -hmm. from consumers and users that this is important to them is critical because that will move the needle. I think that along with inv investor interest and interest of employees, this is becoming an increasingly important topic for employees for attracting and retaining, mm -hmm. for attracting and retaining talent. So I think, uh, I think we're on the right trajectory, but there's definitely more work to be done in, in the corporate sector. And I think for us too, it's not only how we're operating, but also how we can use our technology to enable everyone to drive action too. So I, I, think, uh, I think we have multiple opportunities. Amazon's been a real laggard, but customers and their own employees have, have pushed them forward slowly. The third rank solution on Project Drawdown's list is reduced food waste. They estimate a 50% reduction of the world's food loss loss and waste would cut the equivalent of 70 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions. Reducing food waste takes on many different forms. Uh, in developing countries, food often doesn't make it to hungry people because of storage or distribution problems. In the US and other wealthy nations, we simply throw out lots of food. City Harvest rescues high quality food in New York City that was being discarded in perfect condition, provides it to hungry people. It's been operating for more than 30 years and inspired other organizations around the country, but s senior organization specialist Kate McKenzie says it's only been in the last decade that their work is being recognized for its climate positive effects. Since City Harvest started rescuing food, we've, we've prevented about 600,000 metric tons of methane from being uh, released into the air. And that's the equivalent of taking about 100,000 cars off the street for a year. When I first came to City Harvest, I think we always were um, environmentally minded, but we didn't necessarily pitch that, right? It was like, we're, we've always been green. How sort of um, forward facing we are with that has evolved. Really starting in um, you know, 2010, 2011, the movement of connecting the production of food, the way food is grown, the local food movement, and doing more with less as it connects to climate change really started to take hold. I remember having been in the space for a while when it was seen as, well, there's the environmental folks, the food waste side, and then there's just the anti-hunger community. And increasingly, I would say, particularly over the last six to seven years, the two have really merged. So it's no longer a conversation of you either care about food waste or you care about food insecurity. It's a very large problem of hunger. There's a very large problem of food waste. And if we can solve both together, that's fantastic. But the two sides do need to be talking together. That was Kate McKenzie with City Harvest in New York City. Another example of co-solving problems yeah. that aren't connected but, right. but, yeah. but can be connected. Now for another take on waste, we turn to middle school student Kia Morshet. After observing how much trash his family produced, Kia pr decided he was going to do something about it. He joined the Trash on Your Back Challenge and wore his own trash on his back for a week and documented the whole process on YouTube. Kia, come on up, welcome. Akia, what prompted you to carry your trash on your back for a week? Well, um, I'd say about a year ago, I was walking near the Berkeley Marina, and I saw a big clump of trash there. And that, as well as seeing how much trash me and my family produce in a week, I decided to, uh, to do the trash on your back challenge. 
And so you got this. This is a thing that people can do. I actually did it for a week myself a couple years ago. Um, and so you, you have this plastic bag. And what was the reaction of some of your friends when you started wearing around this little plastic bag with a couple of pink strings on it um, when you went to <laughs> middle school with that? You're 13, right? So you went yeah. to middle school. <laughs> yeah. How'd that, how'd that play? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, at first, I think most of my friends were actually pretty confused about it. <laughs> they, they, they didn't really know what to say at first, uh -huh. but, um, and you know, I got some weird looks from strangers on the bus, but, <laughs> but I eventually, eventually people started asking me what it was about, and in a way I felt like I was kind of inspiring people to do this challenge and reduce their waste mm. by seeing how much they use. Mm. So you got, it, it was a... Um, It was a conversation starter, so you got to talk to people about their own use and, and uh, okay. And did any of your friends volunteer to join you? Yes, uh, yes, I, I had a few friends and also I encourage everyone here to take, uh, take part in this challenge as well. Yeah. <laughs> When I did it, I actually went to the, the symphony and walked out afterwards with, with uh, you know, the trash on my back and, and met the, uh, was then the board chair of Greenpeace. And I said, you should do that. And she looked at me like, yeah, good luck with that. Not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> really? <clears throat> um, what's the grossest thing that you put in your bag? Mm. Well, <laughs> one time there was this little pack of um, chocolate chips and um, there's apparently some, some left or something. And I don't know, I, one time I just looked in there and they were like, they were like melted or something. And I just found that kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> Did your mom let you wear this uh, bag at the dinner table? Yes. <laughs> Pretty good. So <laughs> what do you think is the impact of this? What's, what, what came of it for you? What came of it for people that you interacted with? Well, I think climate change is kind of a, uh, depressing, kind of a depressing thing, and a lot of people are kind of scared of it. So I think a challenge like this shows us that we can bring some fun to like reducing our plastic waste, plastic usage. And so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's something I'd like people to take away from a challenge like this. What's next for you? You have a YouTube, you can check them out on YouTube. Oh, yeah. uh, Mike, what's your? Uh, movies with Mike one. And Mike C one, okay. Yeah. So you're a YouTuber, and, and so you're getting the message out on YouTube. What's next for you in this, in this kind of trash and climate path? Yeah. <laughs> or is that a secret? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still kind of figuring it out, like what, what I'm gonna do next, but I'm, I'm still like occasionally doing like, um, for example, I encourage my friend to do like a one week no meat challenge or, or things like that. Um, so I've been just doing some of that stuff, and I don't, mm. yeah, yeah, pretty much. It, you're 13, it's okay to not know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's give it up for Kia. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> if you were carrying around plastic bags at 13, I don't, yeah, I just wonder, wonder, yeah, wonder what was in them. So, um, <laughs> Reactions to the youth and the waste, Lois. Um, congratulations, and thank you for inspiring us. Um, in, in my work uh, for Pathfinder, I get to travel around the world and meet with a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. And I think that the innovation required to combat climate change uh, is in front of us if we can tap into the creativity and talent of all of humanity. And I often get, as, as you're asking John, you know, why do people, what, how, how is women's empowerment and contraception and family planning connected to climate change? And the most powerful way is that um, if women have the opportunity to be able to be, have a voice and be agents in their community and their country globally, we have the opportunity to have the kind of innovation that we need to be able to combat this. Because as we know, and you know a lot about it in this part of the country, innovation often comes from outside the places of power, outside the places that have created the circumstances. It's disruptive. It comes. <laughs> 
And for most of humanity and in most places, women are, are outside of that and have life experiences and intelligence and creativity to offer to that. Yet it's very difficult to offer that if you don't have the opportunity for contraception. And I told you about my sons. My sons are very close in age. They're 23 months and 23 minutes apart. So I had uh, three sons <laughs> under two, twins a uh, second time. And um, uh, I, I know deep inside me that if I had continued to have children every 23 months, I wouldn't be sitting here with you. I wouldn't have been able to make this contribution. And I think a lot of us in this audience know that what has made a huge difference in our life is to be able to exercise the rights that we've had around that. And um, I, I just give you a, a one example. Um, uh, Doreen Althoro, who's a, a Kenyan woman that we work with, um, uh, she is the program coordinator for the Lake Victoria Basin region. Mm -hmm. Lake Victoria is a big lake in East, and East Africa and Uganda and Kenya border on that, including in addition to other countries. And She's playing a leadership role based on her own experience and what she's seen to now require all the communities in that region to practice both conservation for climate resilience and carbon capture and to be able to offer every woman who wants it family planning. Um, that's the kind of innovation we need to make a difference here. And then if, if I could just add one point which speaks to the number of feet that John referenced is um, Globally, 45% of all pregnancies are unintended. Mm, wow. And uh, the best estimate says that if every woman had contraception when she wanted it, and we know hundreds of millions of women want to use contraception and don't have regular access or any access to it, that number would go from 45% unintended to 7% unintended. And the Wittgenstein Institute in Austria just did an analysis of this, and they looked at two different world uh, outcomes. One where we invest in girls' education, where we invest in family planning, and other ways to build uh, people. And the other where we principally invest in security and defense and anti-terrorism. And they estimated that in this strategy where we're investing in people, including family planning, that about the middle of this century, that population would actually go below where it is now, below 7 billion. And in this strategy, where the investment is in security but not in people, that population size will be about double that, a, around 13 billion. So it, the opportunity to exercise this right that, that, that we've, met, we've had is so key to combating climate change that I wasn't surprised when Drawdown found that that combination of girls' education and family planning was the single highest way to get there. Right, and I think the Hewitt Foundation has been doing some work on that for a long time. But the, the lowest qualm, the key is that this is, you work with local partners. These aren't a bunch of Americans coming in and sort of wagging fingers. So tell us about you know, the, the Western world saying, you brown people have too many babies, stop it. Right. Uh, this is about a human right. And it's a, about everybody's human right to make these kind of decisions about their life and to, and to have the tools to be able to do that. Um, Pathfinder was founded over 60 years ago. Our founders, Clarence and Sarah Gamble, were contemporaries of Margaret Sanger. And Margaret Sanger founded Planned Parenthood of America, and the Gambles founded Pathfinder. And from the very beginning, um, Pathfinder is community-based. So I was in Ethiopia last week, uh, and my team in Ethiopia is Ethi all Ethiopian. Um, when I go to a, I was recently in Niger, and I was in a village outside of Zinder, Niger, and my team there is from that village. It is not possible to do this work by coming in from the outside, because this work is, is deeply cultural, we don't require our staff to have English. Most of the, uh, our staff will have to speak the local language because their job is to work with their neighbors to create the space so that people have options in their life and can exercise their rights. 
John Foley, so much of the, the climate situation is, is about um, scale and transcending the individual and the systemic. What I heard Lois just talk about, like one village at a time. Mm -hmm. And climate people talk about, we got to scale fast. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you, you think about drawdown. P individuals say, what can I do? And you're, how can an individual, but we need systems change, but, but how can an individual affect a system? So I struggle with that, that bridge between the individual mm -hmm. and the systemic level change. Well, when you think about systems in general, there's an idea like a called fractals. You know, there, there's patterns of organization that happen at all scales. So change doesn't happen just at the top or just at the bottom. It's often from the middle out. And so I think that's a mistake we sometimes make that, you know, yes, one individual out of seven billion just doing it all by themselves may be virtuous, but not very effective. But waiting for the UN for 30 years or Washington to just save us from ourselves that hasn't worked out too well either. And so, um, and it's not going to, you know, frankly, I don't think, that we've, I'm done waiting for them. Um, so let's look for other levers. And I think, you know, to really achieve drawdown, um, we looked at a hundred solutions and we actually looked also, it's not in the book, but we looked at the, what we call the level of agency, kind of, you know, what lever gets pulled to make that happen. And sometimes it's international policy, sometimes it's national. Often it's local. Um, some of the most important people in the United States around climate change are people you've never heard of. They're the people who chair a public utilities commission. Mm -hmm. They're the head of your zoning boards. They're people who are often, even not, a, uh, Hal Harvey makes this point a lot too. Mm -hmm. The policy making is often rule based in local communities, states, and counties. And we don't talk about that, but that's huge. But also at the individual level, what you do does matter. This 13 year old kid just inspired a room full of people. I mean, that mattered a lot. You know, that's what we need more of is do the good stuff, then inspire other people through social media, through talking about it. So our, our mutual friend, Catherine Hayhoe, um, who's a wonderful climate uh, communicator and scientist says the most important thing we can do about climate change is talk about it. And she's right, but at the end of the day, it's gonna be behavior change by all of us is necessary. It's going to be policy change, business operations change, and changes in capital, money. And we're going to need all of that. Otherwise, we're just fooling ourselves. Don't pick one lever. Pull them all. You know, every bloody one you can find. And also recognize where there are successes and build on them. Uh, for example, we sometimes get really depressed about this stuff, but the U.S. actually hit our peak emissions in 2007 and they've been going down since. We're 15% lower than we were in 2007. It's a little uptick last year, but I think it's temporary. This is amazing. California, we're making huge progress. Uh, we're the fifth largest economy in the world, and we've committed to carbon neutrality completely by 2045, the largest economy on Earth to do so, by the way. Uh, New York uh, State just matched us in this as well. It made it a law, not just an executive order. And if you just take California and New York together, that's a quarter of the U.S. economy, two states. That's not bad. So, you know, you know, so individuals matter, local places matter, cities matter. It basically, it all matters. I know that sounds trite, but it's true. Um, but where the exciting things is where those boundaries start to cross, where individuals like you and others can inspire a bunch of other people, whether they're in business or local policymaking or maybe all the way to Washington or the UN. We just need all of this all the time merging and mixing together like crazy. And speaking of policy, uh, Kate Brandt, you know, recently there was a number of uh, executives from companies that, that went to Washington, D.C., uh, from eBay, Gap, uh, Nike, Microsoft, Salesforce, you know, for 21 Fortune 500 companies calling for a carbon price, calling for climate action. Um, Google wasn't part of that. So I'm wondering, you know, how much in you engage on policy, because one of the things that... Um, people like Sheldon Whitehouse and others say in Washington, D.C., is tech companies are great with their consumers, great with innovation, but when they come to D.C., they talk taxes, visas, immigration. Now I think tech is worried about being, being big techs, being worried about broken up. Where does climate rank? Yeah, I mean, as I, as I mentioned before, we've been engaged on policy for a long time, and I think to John's point, Yes, federal policy is, of course, important, but also we've been engaged at the state and local level, working with PUCs, working with utilities to try and push the bounds of access to renewable energy, um, which is greening grids in local places. And equally, you know, we have gotten engaged on federal policy. We signed an amicus brief around the Clean Power Plan. Um, we have engaged at many of the climate
government negotiations to share businesses' perspective on why this makes business sense, why we need to move in this direction. Um, so we, are, we absolutely think policy change is a critical piece of it, but we also want to be really strategic about it. We want to use our voice where we think we can have a lot of it. So that's going to be in multiple places, um, but a lot of times it's actually more at a local level. And then one other question, um, there's uh, a Amazon, Google, Microsoft uh, struck deals uh, collectively worth billions of dollars to provide cloud and other services to oil and gas companies. Gizmodo wrote an article with the title, How Google, Microsoft, and Big Tech are Automating the Climate Crisis. That's not your part of the business, but you know that was quite controversial when it happened. There's part of Google that's helping get more oil out of the ground with fewer workers. Help, me, help us understand that part of the business and when you're part of the business. Yeah, it's a very fair question and you're right. It's not my part of the business. So I think you know what I can say is that Google Cloud, like Search, like many of our other tools, it is a platform and it's a platform that's available to all industry sectors and that does include the energy industry. And so there are cloud users from utilities, from clean energy companies and from the oil and gas sector. Um, Equally, it's very important to us that how we operate as a business, how we engage our supply chain, and how we utilize our tools and platforms is having positive impact. And so we also are using our platforms to enable cities to set climate targets, to enable us to measure air quality at a street-by-street -street level to improve quality of life for everyone. So it's a complicated topic, and I certainly don't want to dodge it, but it's also not, not my part of the business. Sure. I mean, uh, big companies are like countries. There's all sorts of there's different power centers within organizations. And I know the policy shop is, that doesn't report to you has different priorities than the, than the, the, the greenies and the sustainability people. And, and it's, a, it's as big as a com, uh, country, really. If you're just joining us, we're talking about sustainability at Climate One with John Foley, Executive Director of Project Drawdown, Kate Brandt, Sustainability Officer at Google, and Lois Quam, CEO of Pathfinder International. I'm Greg Dalton. Uh, John Foley, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the obstacles to some of the, the drawdown levers and, and, and mind, the mindset, the idea, because this touches on Lois too a little bit, some of the gender issues. You know, uh, Carol Dweck at Stanford has the idea of a growth mindset, fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because if humans were just rational and implemented all of the solutions that you identified, We'd get the job done, but that's not happening. So tell us about the mindset <laughs> obstacles. That really sucks, too. I, no, it's like, <laughs> that's been a real problem. Um, so well, what we look at is, uh, you know, it's, we can throw our arms in the air and say, well, this is the world we'd like to have, but this is the one we do have. And uh, what we need to do, I think, is be just really pragmatic is, you know, and in Drawdown, we looked at, you know, like 100 different solutions, but they boil down to like five big areas. Um, if you're thinking about how to solve climate change, here's where you start. Electricity is about a quarter of the problem. Food, agriculture, and forest are also a quarter of the problem, but don't get nearly as much attention. Then you've got buildings, industry, and transportation. Those are the five things we got to change, okay? So electricity, I think, is well underway because uh, it's not policy so much now, it's markets. Solar, wind, and batteries are just getting really cheap. Companies like Google are putting billions of dollars into this and scaling it up. That's happening and tipping really beautifully <clears throat> all over the world. Um, we're beating fossil fuels on the market, not because we put a thumb on the scale. They're just better technologies. You know, Amory Lovins used to say, uh, you know, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The coal age didn't end because we ran out of coal. It ended because it's bad technology. So I think electricity, I feel like we're heading in the right direction. But other sectors like uh, food and forestry and land use, we see some good movement, like uh, the video on food waste. That's the best place to start. About a third to you know, half of the food grown on the planet isn't used. So that's a human, a human tragedy as well as an environmental tragedy because it means half of the food resources, land, water, energy, and materials were also wasted. So that's a good place. Diet changes are going to be important. Uh, stopping deforestation, which Google, by the way, revolutionized the way scientists can track deforestation around the world and gave it away for free. You can beat up on big tech, but sometimes they give back in big ways. So I want to acknowledge that. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Change what my community does hugely. So there are a lot of good things happening. The ones I worry about, though, are around buildings and transportation, because there's always a time lag. Today, you might see somebody buying a new Tesla, but for every new Tesla, there's five SUVs being sold today. 
still, right? Or I don't know what the number is, but it's more than five. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be on the road for about 20 years before they end up in a landfill, 17 years in California. That's a long time to wait to turn over the car fleet. And then you think about buildings. This is a beautiful new lead building, but for every new lead building you build, there's a thousands and thousands of buildings that are kind of old. Mm -hmm. What about them? and the deep energy retrofits they'll need, that'll take about 20 years as well. So that's kind of when I look at obstacles, I see where markets are, you know, what, you gotta think like a tech investor, you think about stage gating, like what's the most limiting thing between today and success? Is it policy, is it markets, is it capital, is it rules, is it technology, and so on. And I think we have to knock down domino by domino by domino in very different ways. And we don't, the same tool doesn't work for everything. It isn't a hammer, because these aren't all nails. Uh, electricity, it's markets, and scaling and investment. And food, I think it is gonna be regulatory. We're gonna need rules to change food waste and diets, not just good feelings. That's starting it, but we're gonna need rules. We're gonna need policy change, but maybe they'll be le local, I don't know. Uh, we need a lot of attention in the Amazon right now, because um, Brazilian deforestation had been going down for decades, and now with a change in government, it may go back up very quickly. If I had $100 million right now, I'd hire a lot of lawyers and descend on Brazil and not leave. Uh, that would be huge. Like save the Amazon from their own government. Uh, it would be huge, working with indigenous communities and uh, uh, environmental groups. So I think there's different tools for different problems. And so when I feel like we're getting stuck, I think we have to zoom in a little bit more and be more granular in the problem. We can't just say climate change has one solution. Um, our, our founder is a guy named Paul Hawken, and he likes to say, the one thing you have to remember about climate change is there isn't one thing <laughs> about climate change. It's a whole bunch of things. Mm. And so let's learn, let's click down one more click and go from climate change to, oh, it's electricity. That's the tool for electricity. It's food, it's buildings, it's cars, and it's industry. We could have different tools for different kinds of problems. And when you do that, I think we, it becomes a lot clearer what's next and where we need to focus our attention. Lois Kwan, what are the obstacles yeah. that are a pre a preventing women from having the agency and, and human rights that, that you, mm -hmm. you've, you've identified? Well, I think for many women around the world, um, it is not having reliable and regular access to family planning and not being able to be educated. Uh, I think about a, a recent experience I had in, in rural Niger, just outside of Zinder, uh, Niger, and... and I was meeting with a group of 15-year-old young women, uh, and they were all married, and they had all had their first child. Mm. And so they didn't have the chance to grow up uh, before, they, before they had their first child, before they were married. They didn't have the chance to, to get a high school a level education. And they were intelligent and creative and interesting people. And uh, the expression on their face when my colleague, who's part of their community, uh, my Pathfinder colleague, was sharing with them in, in Hausa, in their local language, the fact that they could wait to welcome their second child. Because, because historically, many young girls have had two children in the space of a year uh, when they're first married. But the, the, mm. the look on their face, the sort of light on their face with this idea that they could wait a couple years before they welcome their second child. So one of the things, and John and I have talked about this, that's um, really challenging is in the, in the case of family planning, we have the technology and we know how to implement it. It can't be this outside invasion. It has to mm -hmm. be in the community. But we've done this work at Pathfinder for decades and decades and decades. So why hasn't it happened? I think the first thing that time and attention and money is, does not go to the places that really matter to women. Uh, the work that really matters the most to women is always underinvested. And so often it becomes a, a sort of private matter for a woman to find her way through. Um, and this is a moment that I think each of us, men and women in this country, have had the opportunity to have these services, have to reflect on the difference it's made in our own life, and give the opportunity to another girl or boy or man and woman elsewhere in the world who has the same energy and hopes and dreams for their life that, that we have. And you've talked about 
different communities coming together, really successful social movements, and, and we need that now because of the urgency around climate, mm. have been when different sectors come together. Mm. And when we look at the social movement around marriage equality that made a lot of change really quite quickly, and that was a movement that became very successful when different sectors came together, strange bedfellows even at times. Mm -hmm. And I think that now is a moment that, you know, I think this community that is such an innovative community in the Bay Area, that companies and individuals in the environmental movement and the reproductive health movement, we need to come together to get this done, to put the resources in place to get this proven technology in the hands of every person because it makes no sense that today 45% of pregnancies are unintended. Is patriarchy the problem, a part of the problem? Well, I think that things, anything to do with women is underinvested because women aren't in the centers of power to make those kind of decisions. Look at the soccer team these days, right? I mean, the, the soccer team brought in as much money and they got paid a lot less. So I was in New York yesterday and the soccer team had their ticker take parade. So that was very exciting. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that the, the Think of what, what are some of the most important experiences in life, um, giving birth, you know, is like, uh, it, it, and, and for many women across the world, that is a private matter that they have to figure out, you know, how that is going to work and how that is going to happen. I think the fact that women have not been at the table to make those kind of decisions. So I think that for, for us, women who are, because of the advantages that we've had and that women in this audience and around the world and, 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 and men who are partners, you know, it is up to us to step forward to create this opportunity for others because the innovation to address all the challenges that John pointed out, it exists. It needs to be unleashed around the world and half of humanity, uh, women, need to be fully at the table. A little more than half, actually. John, yeah. really? <laughs> yeah. well, <clears throat> just wanted to add yeah. a, a funny little observation. Yeah. Well, not so funny observation is, um, so I, when you run a thing like Project Drawdown, you get a lot of calls from investors, uh, including venture capitalists, who are almost, well, so far to my experience, been 100% white men who have talked to me about this. And a lot of them, like, they love this book. They're like, oh, Drawdown, this should be our guide for investing in climate mm -hmm. change. I'm like, that's great. And they flip through it, but, but not this girl stuff. We don't know what to do with that. That's not a technology play. And I look at them like, are you an idiot? I mean, <laughs> you're talking about like, like health and biotech and pharmaceutical, you know, like an over-the-counter contraceptive that can be used around the world by everybody easily. You don't think that half the planet, well, all the planet would really like that? I mean, come <laughs> on. And they just look blank, like, I don't know what you're saying. It's like I'm speaking an entirely different, and I don't know how to talk about this because I'm another white dude. And you know, I'm like, I don't know what to do about that. But it's just a funny thing. Yeah, like there's yeah. billions mm -hmm. of dollars. And I don't think these are people yeah. who are nece necessarily, you know, uh, misogynistic. They're just, it's a blind spot. They're mm -hmm. like, I, solar panel, I got it. You know, new kinds of steel, I got it. Batteries, I get it. New cars, I get it. But girls, I educate, what? I don't know, you know. But, and, I, you know, I, we need I, more people in the room. But I bet <laughs> a lot of them have used contraception. I bet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I bet. Or... You know, maybe, it, can I borrow that line? <laughs> yes, you can. You can have that line. <laughs> yeah. If you're just joining us, we're talking yeah. about uh, lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> At Climate One, I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are Lois Quam, CEO of Pathfinder International, Kate Brandt, Sustainability Officer at Google, and John Foley, Executive Director of Project Drawdown. We're going to go to a lightning round with true or false questions for our guests. Um, true or false, uh, Kate Brandt, greenwashing is prevalent in Silicon Valley. Hmm. I would say no. In my experience, I think there's actually kind of an allergic reaction to greenwashing, certainly for us at Google, but I think at other, I think at other companies in Silicon Valley, too. Uh, true or false, Kate Brandt, the U.S. Navy made more progress on clean energy during the Obama administration than any other part of the federal government. True. <laughs> uh, John Foley, true or false, climate philanthropy is well-targeted and effective. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, it is sometimes, and it could be better. Um, I'm going to weasel out of that one. <laughs> a little different on the better. phone, but okay. Um, um, the uh, Lois Quam, yeah. 
Climate One should hand out male contraceptive pills at our events. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> True. Uh, yes. Once they're approved, there's a couple of them. To John's point about you know venture investing, there's a couple yes, of them. Yes, it must be FDA approved. F- they're not course, FDA course, approved yet, yeah. but they're yeah. on the works. Male yeah. contraceptive pills. Um, True or false, Kate Brandt, Google used to sell ads that showed hoax or other information when people search for climate change. Mm, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, John Foley, true or false, the Green New Deal is realistic and viable. Oh, gosh. Um, (laughs) No. Uh, It could be at the local level, but at the federal level, I think it's more of an organizing principle and needs some work, but it will will inspire lots of other actions, which would be great. Uh, Lois Quam, true or false, uh, the Catholic Church is one of the biggest obstacles to women recognizing full rights over their bodies and reproductive choices. One of the biggest. Um, uh, we actually work with Catholic communities in Africa and make real progress. Uh, and we work with uh, religious leaders. We've, we, we organize the writing of the Quranic Guide to Family Planning. So um, our... It's not a monolith, of course, the Catholic Church. It's a big thing. Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Our, our strategy is to work with religions to create these rights. So nice so, way to say yeah. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Let's give them a round of applause for getting through the lightning round. Uh, before we go to audience questions, we're in, a, in a, an electoral year. People are, you know, climate is rising on the political uh, agenda. John Foley, how do you see that, you know, giving boost to these sorts of things? Or is that kind of a distraction for uh, the political theatrics, a distraction from getting real things done? Well, I mean, it's, it's always good when you hear climate change on anything. I'm happy. You know, that's good. I'm really glad that this is happening in Washington, uh, finally, uh, or maybe another wave of it. Uh, AOC, for example, has been you know, amazing on this issue in terms of raising the, uh, the level of rhetoric. And the Green New Deal has been a great organizing principle around that. Uh, but I do worry if we all put our eggs in that basket of like, oh, we'll wait for Washington to save us. I have these kind of flashbacks to 2008, where we had a popularly elected, you know, Barack Obama with a very large majority in the Senate and the House, and you guys were there, and we still couldn't pass a climate deal then when it was a very easy political landscape compared to today. So I, I just don't think a single master stroke of legislation of a Green New Deal signed by, you know, um, this president or maybe any. Uh, is going to happen right away. So we're going to have to look for local and state things in the meantime. And the U.S. is making progress. You know, coal, whether Trump says coal is back, doesn't matter. Coal's gone. It's not going to. So a lot of these things are just going to happen anyway. And so I think we, um, it's great to have this political rhetoric in, in Washington, but I think we get seduced by it a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of kind of beltway head in the media. And there's a lot of... Um, you know, Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial complex. I think we're much more in danger of the media political complex today. Um, not here, <laughs> but, but you know, we kind of we just hear a lot of barking mm. and not a lot of action, especially in D.C. And it's covered constantly, and it's stressing us all out. I, I think I'd rather you kind know, of get my hands dirty doing something real. Uh, right now in your community, in your state, and see what can happen. And let's start tipping the scales wherever we can. With that said, we definitely need every national capital to be part of this conversation as well. We just can't wait for them anymore. Uh, we're, you know, mm. And Washington has never really led on big issues like this, like marriage equality, other things. It happens at other levels and finally arrives at Washington later. So let's continue that. Mm-hmm. It's a larger social movement, as Lois is saying. And let's make sure that happens and is received by Washington, not led by Washington. Well, Kate Brandt, a lot of businesses are not waiting for policy. They're moving for economic and self-interested reasons. So you can, I'd like to hear you on that. And also whether you're know, operating in other countries, because other countries have not slowed down like the U.S. has. As Europe, Europe is going forward, uh, other countries, you know, China's moving forward. So do you see leadership in other countries? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I, I've been incredibly heartened by the amount of action that we're seeing by businesses. You know, we recently were founders of an organization called REBA, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. And this is um, about 200 companies that have come together to push for getting about 60 gigawatts of renewable energy on the grid in the U.S. by 2025. And along the way, engaging with policymakers and driving this change together. So that is a great example of where we're seeing business action that's really driving change. And you're absolutely right. In Europe, for example, they're much further along on climate policy, and we have the ability to do even more there to um, enter into new kinds of uh, joint agreements with many companies to get wind onto the grid. And, and nonetheless, still we're there to make our voice heard with policymakers that this is an important business priority for us, that we're seeing not only that this is good for us because it enables us to operate as a clean energy company, but also it's enabling there to be positive change and business sense. This makes sense for us from a hedging our prices. We're locking in long-term prices of clean energy. That has a very strong business case for us. So I think that's tremendously important. Also, I think there's a huge role for technology companies and other companies to enable policymakers. So some of the work that we've mm -hmm. done that I'm the most proud of is creating tools for policymakers that give them the ability to drive change. So one great example is a tool that we launched last year called the Environmental Insights Explorer. This is for cities, not big cities, wonderful cities like San Francisco that have whole teams that can work on climate action planning, but for smaller and medium-sized mm -hmm. cities who don't have the capacity to to do a greenhouse gas inventory to set climate goals. So we're trying to create tools that are freely available to enable policymakers to drive that change in their own cities. The city of San Jose, just down the road from us, they were working on their climate action plan and they wanted to set an aggressive solar energy target. So they came to this tool that we have, they assessed their solar potential, and then they set a gigawatt clean energy target thanks to that ability that we were able to put in their hands. There's one other uh, example that meant a lot locally. You know, we've had a lot of smoke from wildfires recently, and, and yes. you know, the way the air quality is measured by the EPA, there's like one sensor in a city. Uh, Google's partnering with some uh, companies, I think, to put the, the cars that drive yes. around on Aklama as a company exactly. uh, based down the street. So tell us about that mm -hmm. brings, that can tell you about the air quality on your block, yes. uh, very local, which is much more meaningful when there's a fire or another time, and bringing data. And I think the polluters don't like to be kind of... Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to know, right? Because they can out individual sources. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. In a lot of cities, you might have one or just a handful of air quality sensors, and they're going to be stationary on a few buildings. So through this project, which is called Project Airview, we partnered with the Environmental Defense Fund and a great local company called Aklama to attach air quality sensors to our street view cars. So these sensors can measure things like NOx, SOx, particulate matter, CO2, and give you a street-by-street -street picture of air quality. So we did this uh, across the bay in Oakland, and so we were able to create a data set that shows where are those hot spots where air quality is the worst, and often that's in some of our most vulnerable communities. So we think tools like this can be incredibly powerful in giving people really actionable data that they can use to drive change. We're going to go to our audience questions. We're talking about uh, sustainability and drawdown at Climate One. We um, welcome you to join us with one one part comment or question. The microphone's back there. We'll get through as many as we can, and uh, encourage you to to keep it uh, crisp. And uh, if you need help with that, I'm here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's we'll get people there. Let's, uh, boy. A stampede. <laughs> uh -oh. Welcome to Climate One. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for all of the great things you're doing. I'm at the other end of the uh, age spectrum from our 13-year-old, but I pick up bags on the street and fill them with plastic trash. Mm -hmm. Everybody, fill your bags with plastic mm -hmm. trash and put them so they don't go in the bay. Thank you. Uh, Lori Sinsley, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, this uh, question is really for Jonathan. Uh, one of the things that you talked about was capital as a lever mm -hmm. and um, finding solutions that work and building upon them. And then your other comment about philanthropy could be more effective. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in finding out um, how to identify projects, solutions that are working um, to invest in. 
funny you should ask that. Um, so well, you're, you're in the most important city in the world uh, for climate philanthropy. A lot of the big foundations that fund climate philanthropy are here. There's also a consortium of the largest of the climate funders called Climate Works, which is right here in San Francisco. And they've launched another initiative called the Climate Leadership Initiative, which is trying to get you know, ultra high net worth individuals, many from tech, to become climate philanthropists. Because there's about a billion dollars a year now, I believe, in climate philanthropy. It should be 10, it should be 100. Uh, that's more than venture funding, by the way, in energy and climate. Uh, philanthropy is far more important than venture funding right now in terms of absolute dollars. Both need to radically increase. So that's really, really important. But what I worry about is a lot of them, you know, about 80% of the money is going to 20% of the atmosphere. Uh, so much of it is going into electricity and batteries because that's a nice tech problem, not into women and girls mm. at all, as I mentioned, or food waste or, um, you know, like uh, shifting diets, although impossible meats and beyond, mm -hmm. or impossible foods beyond meats are getting a lot of attention now as a plant-based substitute. So I think we need to kind of align the money with the physics. And so one of the things we're trying to do in Drawdown 2.0, uh, we're going to be developing a lot of investor guides and philanthropy guides saying, hey, you should all, if you're going to spend a billion dollars on climate change, maybe you should stop and think about the physics and the chemistry for just 20 minutes. So just like a little course, like here's where the gases come from, here's where you might want to think about your investments. We're also working with a group called the Prime Coalition based in Boston, which is a consortium of about 100 funders. Uh, looking at ways to build tools, like kind of models that you would look at a project by project basis using our drawdown um, simulation models that we developed in the book applied to an investment vehicle and say, you know, what's the financial return on investment? What's also the carbon return on investment? And also, I noticed in the front rows, uh, Terry and Peter Boyer, who uh, run uh, some philanthropic work here. Terry is a leader in bringing together climate funders from family offices and, and foundations of all sizes across America, and actually asked me to speak to, I think it was a couple hundred funders in Napa recently. And again, I think there's a lot of just education and connecting the dots and building kind of a Rolodex so people can help each other. And that's where we're going to make some big, big differences. And San Francisco is ground zero for that. This could be great. Next question. Welcome. Hi, I'm John Suter from Reedus Associates. I had a comment and I'd like to see what you think about this. Um, I mentioned one time uh, uh, I met Naomi Klein in New York and I said, I think the American people are negotiating with our leaders. And the American people's point of view is that if climate change is so bad, why are you all still flying around? And I, and I think I brought this up partly because this last week there, there was a new record set of over two million passengers in one day. And when I talk to uh, airline pilots, a lot of them really don't put much thought into it. Uh, and I had suggested a no-fly Wednesday, uh, where all commercial airliners not fly every Wednesday. It could be a, it could be a Sabbath, a, uh, a flying Sabbath. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I wrote to the, a lot of airlines, and they, they were polite, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if they don't take control in some way like this, I think their decisions will be made for them. But I, I'm curious Thank what you, you, what the you think about. The idea of personal action, we're all conflicted, people fly, mm -hmm. and, and I, I interview a lot of people who, who are climate evangelists who fly in and out, and, and they fly, right, John? Yeah, yeah. I think that was, yeah that's what I'm... You know, for the average climate scientist, folks, you know, definitely flying is the biggest single part of their personal carbon footprint, no question. Uh, but when you look at the whole atmosphere, uh, aviation, all the planes in the world is about 1% of our emissions. So, but it's getting far more than it's growing quickly, the, though. This is true. Uh, but I think the benefits of international travel and learning about the world are pretty good. There's a lot of really stupid things in it, like food waste. Nobody benefits from that. Mm -hmm. Or clear cutting the Amazon. Like we don't, but fly, you know, I think it's good that people see other countries. With that said, aviation has gotten more efficient. The fuel efficiency of the per passenger mile has doubled in the last 20 years. And there will have to be alternative ways to fly. I don't think just telling people you can't do something that's really great is a good solution. Uh, when there might be other technologies, you know, there will be some electrification of uh, small planes. That can be, there can be battery powered small planes. Long ones will have to be some kind of sustainable aviation fuel. I think we're clever enough to be able to do that. I w I'd like to live in a world where people can still be interconnected and visit each other without destroying the atmosphere. And if San Francisco can't figure that out, nobody can. So let's figure that out, because I, I don't think sacrifice is a good way to build a future, because people aren't going to do it. Uh, so we have to figure out a smarter way. 
August 20th, we're doing an event here on flying cars. There's a lot of innovation mm -hmm. and disruption happening on, on drones and Uber mm -hmm. Elevate and all sorts of, it's a wild world. And a lot of it is driving battery driven uh, aviation and other disruptions that'll, that'll really, that there's a lot of exciting things there. That's August 20th here in this room. Also, uh, upcoming podcast from Climate One is all about carbon offsets. When people fly, mm -hmm. they often think about offsets. So we took a deep dive into offsets and looked into that murky world. That's an upcoming uh, podcast. Next question, please. Sure. I want to first acknowledge the four of you for the really deep dedication that each of you have to creating a future that we all want. And my question is for Lois Quam and either of you that would also like to answer. If we assume that what got us here won't get us there yeah. and that there's a deep system transformation mm -hmm. needed to create that future we all want, mm -hmm. We also need to transform ourselves in order to mm -hmm. transform systems. So I'm curious about who you as a leader need to become in order mm -hmm. to cultivate that sort of transformation that you see that's possible in the space of women's health and reproductive rights. Yeah, well, thank you. It is that um, we need to uh, transform ourselves. And it, it um, I think it starts with a, a deep, empathy and compassion, and that involves, um, you know, a lot of listen, listening and being vulnerable to what you experience, and then trying to take that in and work with others to create a vision to, to do, and I think that the whole model of a leader sort of knowing what to do and then creating followers and moving forward, I think we've demonstrated that that isn't, um, that isn't a way to live. Uh, and so it's in a leadership that is able to hear and learn and see in others what we uh, what we see in ourselves in that way, I think that's the kind of leadership that um, that we all need to strive for to get to a better place. Yeah, I've had interviewed people on the stage who say all change begins within. A lot of yeah. the climate conversation is othering. China should change. Chevron should change. Republicans should change. So and so mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. someone else should do something. Um, so also September 5th, we're having a mindfulness and, and, and climate conversation here with an author who will explore that more deeply. Let's go to our next question. Welcome. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, thank you to all of you. So my question is really around, uh, what we can do as Californians. I know you mentioned we're the fifth largest mm -hmm. economy. I don't know how much of our food feeds the nation, but I know it's a lot. Um, and I know, Greg, your, some of your upcoming um, programming is the Mark Arax, The Dreamt Land Book. And I had to stop reading that because it was giving me panic attacks about mm. water and nuts. And it wasn't even talking about beef. It was about nuts. And it was like, oh, God, we can't even eat nuts. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I guess my question, especially for you, Kate, is just what, what can we do as individuals or as industry here in California as we're watching things go dry as we're trying to secretly suck water from here and there and still those wonderful pistachios are all over the place and I mean like what what can we do you know when my parents generation like the car companies they paid for the roads they paid they built highways they they really gave back and I think you know really your your role with big tech might be to go up with our government here and just say, you know, Gavin or whomever, we really need to deal with water. We need to fix our subsidies because if we can't do it in California, how are we going to do it in the Midwest? Thank you. Yeah. So thank, thank you for the question. And I, I really appreciate that we've had a theme throughout the conversation tonight around individual action and really empowering people to take individual action. Um, and I wanted to tell you about a tool that we built actually starting with John and his team, which is basically based on the very basic premise that what we know is that our biggest impacts on the planet are, as we've been talking about, how we use energy, how we use water, and how we eat food, how we consume food. And so we built a tool with the team at the California Academy of Science 
Sciences uh, called Your Plan, Your Planet. So check it out, Your Plan, Your Planet. It's uh, yourplanyourplanet.co. And this tool has very easy science-based things that people can do in your everyday life to reduce those aspects. So for example, when you think about energy use, uh, turning down your hot water heater turns out to be an excellent way to reduce your energy footprint at home. If everyone across California, let alone the country did that, that would have a tremendous impact. Or we're talking about water. A great way to reduce water use at home is to put your dishes in the dishwasher rather than washing them by hand. So what we really wanted to do with this mm. tool was put science-based, easy, actionable things that people can do every day in their hands, on their phone, on their computer. Um, and I, if we all did these things, it would be tremendously impactful. So I really encourage you to check this out. And we also developed a companion curriculum that's on our Google Teacher Center that's now being taught in classrooms because what we learned is that kids love this. They love doing this at home with their parents, just like your great example with your trash. Um, so I really encourage you to check this out. It's a great way to empower everyone to take action in their everyday lives. Yes, don't, don't stop oh. there. Keep going. Oh. Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of a companion to that. There was a, this collaboration is, uh, was at the Cal Academy. It was uh, it's called planetvision.com and .org. You can check that out too. That has some uh, other rich information. And Drawdown, later we'll do an individual Drawdown kind of guide as well. We haven't done that yet, but we will soon. And change your uh, water heater from gas to electric. That's yeah. the one. Can I add in this? Lowest. California should do what it's done so well so many times and uh, fuel a social movement that brings this together, that brings this investment in women and girls and this focus on climate change together and inspire the rest of the world. California is good at that mm -hmm. and we need you. <laughs> yeah, it takes, takes movements. Uh, let's go to our next question. Welcome. Hi, Gary, Malaysian. Thanks. It was a great presentation. Uh, I would like to ask a question of the entire, everyone in the room. How many drove here tonight in a car? Electric car. Electric. About 10%, maybe 5% of them. And how many of those cars were EVs? About half of them. So, every, so other people walked <laughs> or took the bus? Mm -hmm. Just curious. Just curious, somebody's not raising their hand because I think a lot more people <laughs> drove here than are admitting it. And if they're dri not driving EVs, and this is San Francisco, they have to look in the mirror and when they get home and say, what am I doing? <laughs> Next question. Hi, I'll, I have two things. One is um, I was in Montana at Yellowstone National Park a couple years ago, and we had a presentation by a hydrologist. And I asked him, I said, since we have this big problem with water, why do I see these farmers and ranches having this big spray uh, kind of mm. what, watering system when they know that a third of that water is going to evaporate before it hits the ground? And he said, it's because they know if they do not use all their water, they won't get the same allotment for the following year. Mm. So what do we do about that? Water policy in the U.S. is just insane. I'm sure Greg can mention this, but the technology too is kind of, um, I, um, so just FYI, in the world, 70% of the water we take out of nature is used to do one thing, irrigate crops and pastures. It's 85% of the water we take out of nature and doesn't come back to the same watershed. So to first approximation, all the water we use in the world is food. Uh, some of that's for very good use, some of it's not. Um, I used to be a professor for 20 years, and I used to ask my students for 20 years, could you invent a machine that wastes water faster than center pivot irrigation? <laughs> in, <laughs> in 20 years, nobody's done it. Um, no, seriously, it's like, it's designed, I mean, it's a 45 degree angle in the sun, the middle of the day with little, I mean, like, oh my God, these are evaporation machines. It evaporates more water than an open swimming pool. Um, you're laughing, but it's true. Uh, so, but the Israelis can grow uh, the same amount of calories with one-tenth the water we do in the U.S. We're using drip irrigation, tenfold increase, not 50%, you know, a tenfold increase. Mm. But we in the US are about 10 times more efficient delivering a calorie with the same amount of water as India does, because they tend to mm. flood entire huge mm -hmm. fields with relatively low productivity crops, except rice. Mm -hmm. So there's a hundredfold difference between, let's say, somebody in Pakistan and India versus Israelis. So we can solve this problem. 
The good thing about being really dumb with water and dumb with energy is you can stop. <laughs> that's good. Uh, so uh, that's the good news. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm giving lots of plugs tonight, but uh, someone mentioned Dream to Land. Next week, we have some fabulous writers about water, the story of water in the West in California. And one of those experts, uh, Faith Kearns, told me that we've had this, dri this move to away from flood irrigation to drip irrigation. And now they're thinking, well, actually, Flood irrigation actually helped replenish aquifers, and maybe it's not as bad as we thought it was. So, yes. all these people who yeah. put in drip irrigation now they're saying, "Well, maybe it was better the way you were doing it before." So, I don't know. Come next week and find out mm. how crazy that is. Let's go to our next question. Thank you very much. We talked about transportation as an important thing that we need to reduce, and it's a slippery slope in that fossil fuel companies have been supplying the demand. As the previous, just before mentioned, many of us drove here, some of us came in public transportation, but the fossil fuel companies will tell you that they're providing to the market. And although that is, and that is true. And which is first? How are we going to address that? At some point we can say, fossil fuel companies, you need to understand that this is a, is something that's hurting the globe. But at what point do you, how do we stop this um, cycle of SUVs versus EVs? And uh, in the United States, as well as th throughout the, West of the rest of the world, particularly China. Thank you. Um, there's no viable scenario, John Foley, that, has, that doesn't include fossil fuels mm -hmm. decades from now. So they're not going away. Yeah. I mean, fossil fuels are amazing in a lot of ways. It's just really, too, it really stinks that CO2 is like messing with our climate because fossil fuels are like the most energy dense thing you can have. Uh, they can contain more energy in a pound of gasoline than you could ever put in a battery. Other than like nuclear materials, gasoline and petroleum are amazing substances. So it's kind of, a, they're, they're really wonderful in some ways, but then there's the cost. And so we have to figure out new ways to you know, do transportation. Electric cars are one way, but designing better cities in the first place where people can just walk would be a whole lot better. And so this is where European cities are doing better things with bike lanes. You can't add bike lanes without taking out a car lane. San Francisco still hasn't learned that, in my opinion. Um, go to Portland or Minneapolis or Boston, and you can see how American cities can get biking right. Uh, we haven't yet. But we can do that kind of stuff, or the little scooters, or whatever. We're going to have to figure out new ways of getting around. But the good thing is we still want to get around. There can be electric cars, but I think we need to think completely differently about mobility. Uh, the, the solutions do exist. That's the good news. There are ways to do this. But we're going to still be using at least some fossil fuels for quite a while. But it'll be dramatically less uh, in order to escape the climate crisis. Uh, last question. Hi, thank you all. And John, I'll need to talk to you about ideas for student projects. Uh, I have a question for Kate. A few years back, I had the opportunity to hear from one of Google's heads of energy and sustainability at Berkeley at a conference. And I remember a statistic, I might be remembering it wrong, but what I remember is that 15% of all the electricity use in the US went to storing data. And so I know that data farms are in Iceland where it's cooler and it will take less electricity to store data. So I imagine that number has only gone up since then, a few years back. So while all these apps to track um, trees and deforestation and ways that greenhouse gases are being reduced are great, what can we do about reducing the amount of our own personal data that goes out to the cloud? Because the cloud is actually plugged into something where electricity is being used. It's not just an ethereal kind of thing out there. So, um, you know, for me, I'm, I know that my phone is tracking every step I take. Little devices on my wrist and my back are tracking whether I'm standing up straight and um, how many miles I've just run and that kind of thing. And that's costing a lot of energy. So is there any trend to limit the usage, not just make the data that we are storing um, renewable? Thank you for the question. So, so just to clarify, um, I'm happy to tell you 15% is not the correct statistic. All global data centers use the same amount of energy as the airline industry. So as John just told you, that's about 1% of energy use, same with data centers. So absolutely large energy users, um, but, but we're talking about kind of between 1% and 3%, depending on the study that you're looking at. 
Nonetheless, data center energy efficiency is absolutely critical. And actually, UC Berkeley did a study a couple of years ago that showed um, that the industry has made tremendous progress on this. So for example, at Google, we recently took some measurements and we found that compared to five years ago, we're getting seven times more compute, so more streamed videos and more emails sent for the same amount of energy. So we need to keep driving on efficiency. And we need to be matching all of that energy use with clean energy, which is also what we're doing. And increasingly, you're seeing other cloud providers. Um, but you're absolutely right. We all can be thoughtful about turning down you know, the brightness on our phones, turning the brightness on our apps. At Google, we've started offering that on some of our apps, like Calendar. Um, so there's certainly a role that we, that, that we can each play as individuals. But also, we're really working on this as an industry. And at Google, it's very important to us. But that's that combination of energy efficiency, but also the carbon neutrality as well. And clean your cloud, delete your files. We have to wrap up. I'd like to um, <laughs> um, invite you to reception afterwards with some delicious food out there. You can say hello to Kia uh, and uh, talk to him some more and mingle with each other. Apologies to the questions we didn't get to. Um, we have to wrap up. Um, invite you to participate also in our Let's Talk Climate campaign. You know, we have this, these, some of these will be out there. Take a photo, put it on social media, get people talking about climate, as John Foley, Catherine Hale, and others say. It starts with a conversation that leads to action. Thanks for participating with that. I'd like to give a, a shout out to the Climate One crew. I get to sit up here in the bright lights with these fabulous, illuminating people. But let's give a shout out uh, a round to the Climate One crew for um, making this happen. We've been talking about pathways to reversing climate disruption, including reducing food waste, empowering and educating women in the developing world and elsewhere, and a host of other technologies and policies. Our guests were John Foley, Executive Director of Project Drawdown, a nonprofit group advancing the top ways to reverse climate change, Kate Brandt, Sustainability Officer at Google, and Lois Quam, CEO of Pathfinder International, which supports women's reproductive rights in developing countries. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available where ever you podcast. I'm Greg Dalton. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you.